All right, so welcome to, I think this is Math 317. Good. So this is Introduction to Operations Research. I had to give William some kind of title for this. Really, you could call this class a Introduction to Efficiency. And so operations research began probably back when we had hunters and gatherers. You know, the need to do things better. I really developed around World War II when the stakes were extremely high. And so a little bit later today, if time permits, I will read uh, some interesting articles and tidbits about the history of operations research. And so what I want to do today is cover a lot of the mechanics. This is a large class. The cap for this class, I'm relaxing it a little bit so long as we still have space for people to sit down. And that's going to be essentially the defining factor. There are M&Ms. You are free to grab M&Ms for class participation. There is no uh, disadvantage to speaking and getting something wrong. I only remember things that are correct. So if you make a good comment in class, just email it to me so I can add it to my record for letters of recommendation. You may take M&Ms in advance, but then that does obligate you to make comments in class, you know, preferably the day you're taking the M&Ms. Okay? You know, I don't want to wait till the end of the semester and all of a sudden you realize, I've got 55 minutes of talking to you. Okay? <laughs> so I'll talk a little bit about the mechanics, but you know, feel free to grab M&Ms, feel free to bring food, drinks, whatnot, like that. Okay. Uh, so we will see if the clicker goes. Right, so the, okay, so I have to look at the reflected things over here. So this should be introduction and objectives. Okay, so now here's a couple of things. The main topic is obviously I want you to learn some of the key ideas of operations research. There's you know, a vast number of things we could cover. One of my favorites is linear programming. The reason is you don't need to know that much to be able to use it as a good black box. And I can illuminate a lot of the workings of linear programming. So how many of you have taken linear algebra? How many of you have not taken linear algebra but realize you're supposed to raise your hand right now? All right. That is, I think, the only prerequisite for this course. This is a pre-core 300 level course. So I just want to be very clear on what this means. This means I am not assuming you've done analysis. I am not assuming you have done algebra because those of you who know me, <laughs> I've never taken algebra. Okay? I actually somehow got through the math major without ever taking algebra. All right, so I am definitely not going to force you to do something that I would never do myself. So <laughs> that is not a requirement for this course. Analysis would be wonderful, but right now the way the college is running, we need more pre-core 300 level courses, so analysis is not required. Programming would be wonderful. And so I will not require you to know programming. Instead, I will just require you to learn it very quickly. And that's how we get around constraints like this. Now, how many of you here are CS majors? Okay, excellent. So this class, we just have four people who just volunteered to be TAs. Wonderful. This class was almost tri-listed math, stats, and CS. And so it came close, okay? Depending on what you want to do, there are a lot of different directions this class can go. And again, I'm happy to work with you. This is a chance for you to control your education. What I do not want to do is I do not want to go through every step of algebra on the board. This is not the most productive use of my time. It's not the most productive use of your time. This is a 300 level course. You should be able to read things and get back to me. Uh, get back to each other. You are a wonderful resource for each other. We are working on getting a TA for this class. If anybody is interested in being a TA for this class, yes, you may TA a class you are taking. You may even grade yourself, okay? So if you are interested in being a TA, please let me know. We have operations research all about efficiency. You know, we can come to some kind of agreement, okay? So what do I want you to get out of this class? Depends on what you want to get out. So one of the first homework assignments is for you to send me a paragraph describing what are your goals, why do you want to take this class, what do you want this to prepare you for. This is a great thing to do a project in. And I've had students do projects in everything from having a bike exchange program on campus to what is the cheapest way to keep people alive. And before you ask, no, they're not using this in Pereski. Okay? <laughs> they're using the least amount of space possible. <laughs> they went the other way for those of you who've been on ERLAC with me. So there's a huge option for things to do. Later in this talk, uh, I will give you some suggestions of things to do. And I've also talked to various companies about jobs for us. And when I've taught this class before, I've actually gone in jobs for students. Sometimes they're paid, sometimes they're not paid. Do you guys want to be paid? Is that the most important thing for you right now? No. Most important thing is? Cool projects, experience, letters of recommendation, right? So I wish I could get you, you know, wonderful, you know, four-digit, five-digit salaries. Not going to happen. 
maybe we can get something, but the main thing is to be able to, when you have a job interview, to be able to say, here is something non-trivial that I did and has been implemented. Okay, so we definitely will have several opportunities along those lines. So I want to emphasize techniques and asking the right questions. How many of you have ever watched a TED lecture? How many of you have ever heard Malcolm Gladwell talk about spaghetti sauce? All right. This is one of my favorite uh, TED lectures. And so this is on the web page. I will advise you to listen to that over the weekend. I love throwing work at you very quickly. It leads to hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue for a company because they asked a question that everybody else had missed. Most of math, most of life is trained monkey work. We train you hard so you have a good skill set. The difficulty is asking the right questions and figuring out where can you apply things. So for the people who've had me before, what's my favorite quote? Good. When all you have is a hammer, pretty soon every problem looks like a nail. Right. If I ever have a coat of arms, and then make a wonderful graduate note, if I ever have a coat of arms, there will be a hammer on it. And there's a lot of ways to look at this. One way is that you get really good at something, and you find a way to convert whatever you're looking at to this area of expertise, and you just hammer away and solve it. The other thing is if you have a hammer, go to the land of the screwdriver. If you use the same techniques on the same problems as everyone else who has the same training as you, it is very hard to distinguish yourself. It's a very hard competition. If you go to an area where people do not have the same tool set as you, you can often make great progress. And so I've actually applied a lot of techniques in number theory in fields very far from number theory. And you know, again, I have a different tool set and it works very well. Another one is to model problems and analyze what happens. And this is where stats and computer science will come in beautifully. When I was a postdoc at Ohio State, I participated in a data analysis seminar. And one of my favorite quotes was, every day the satellites in orbit are beaming down more information about the weather than is in the entire Library of Congress. And the forecasters have only a couple of hours to analyze this massive amounts of data and have their models say something meaningful. How do you deal with this much information? When you have this much information, it's actually a problem. You have to figure out which information really matters. How many of you know about Galileo's experiment where he dropped uh, two spheres to see about gravity? Okay, what colors were they? Come on, anybody know? Probably a dark grayish. <laughs> <laughs> yes? I believe one was copper and the other was lead. If that is correct, you have just earned massive amounts of extra credit. <laughs> the only thing you did wrong is I believe. You know, just sound confident. You know, one of them was copper, one of them was lead. Sounds good. <laughs> Do you think it matters what color they were? It could matter slightly. Maybe if they've been out in the sun a long time, one of them gets a lot hotter than the other. If you have a hot object dropping through the atmosphere, that could make a difference. But if they're both at the same temperature, I don't think the color is going to really matter. So when you're making your model, you have to figure out what are the key features, what really matters, and what doesn't. And that is not always easy. You want to put in as much as you can and still have the model mathematically tractable. Or if not mathematically tractable, at least be at the point where you can do some simulations and get some ideas of what the behavior should be. All right. Another one is elegant solutions versus brute force. All right. There are a lot of things where there are beautiful ways of looking at things, and if you look at it just the right way, everything comes out beautifully. These are called cookbook college problems. Right? Uh, how many of you have taken the Putnam exam? So in the slides I started to show for this class for the little questions, uh, the final exam for that class is the Putnam. There are six questions. Each one is worth 10 points, 120 total. If you get one out of 120 points, that's a good score. The most common score in the Putnam is a zero. And these are only the good students who are taking the Putnam to really just put this exam in perspective. Every Putnam problem has an elegant, simple solution if you look at it the right way. The difficulty is finding that way to look at it. In the real world, you are not always fortunate enough to have a situation where you are going to have an elegant solution. Sometimes you have to brute force. And then the question becomes, can you do the brute force in the amount of time that you have? So one of my favorite examples is imagine you own American Airlines. What is your objective? I'm sorry? Profit. Profit. Make money. Right? What is the wrong answer? Get people from now. 
usually either getting people from one place to the other or government bailouts, usually those are the two ways you make money <laughs> as an airline. But your objective is not to fly people from A to B. Your objective is to make money. This is how you do it. We may have something that will give us the optimal schedule for American Airlines for the next month, but it may take five years for the program to run. American Airlines is not going to wait five years for the program to run. What we can often do is we can often get approximations to the solutions fairly quickly. And for a lot of things, the approximations are close enough. So if you think about mathematical models, you often have a very complicated system where you have to estimate certain parameters that you then feed into it. Well, if the parameters are themselves only estimates of reality, it seems to me a little bit harsh to force an exact answer with inexact numbers. And so really you want almost confidence intervals, you want some kind of suggestions. It's not always clear what's going to be the best thing to do. And how long will it take to find them? One of the things that's wonderful about linear programming is frequently you can get to the point where in a matter of minutes you can say, I don't know what the best answer is, but I know I'm off by at most half a percent in terms of my revenue. We have ways to bound how far we are from the optimal answer, even if we don't know what the optimal answer is. And so this is one of the new perspectives that's going to come into play in this class from other classes. And if you've taken a calculus course, when I give you an integral, I'm not looking for a range of possible antiderivatives. Unless this is the plus C stuff, okay? Now, other than that, I'm not really looking for a range. I'm looking, what is the answer? What is the area under the curve? You know, I want a nice number. Here in operations research, I want a strategy. I want a way to do things. And it's not always going to be clear if there will be a optimal that I can find in a reasonable amount of time. All right, another one is writing a textbook for the American Mathematical Society. So I have written several books. I could get this book under contract if I wanted to. I don't because I have uh, another book that I want to finish first. But I would like to write a book on a senior seminar on, oh, I don't know, Operations Research Advanced Linear Algebra. And so this is an outstanding opportunity, if you want, to be involved in something like this. And again, for those of you who are considering various things, you want things to talk about. A huge part of this class is going to be doing projects. I'll be talking about that in more detail, but that would easily feed into something like that. All right, so here are a couple of problems we can look at. One of the first ones, and I briefly mentioned this, is the diet problem. You know, what is the cheapest way to keep someone alive? Okay, this could be useful if you're a dictatorial country like... North Korea, that's a great example for something like this, right? You want to keep the population alive, you want to keep them cheaply, what is the optimal diet? In America, this is probably not the problem we want to solve, right? What kind of problems might we want to solve? Oprah Winfrey is really good at this one. Cheapest way of keeping everyone happy? Cheapest way of keeping people happy, happy, healthy, something along those lines. You might want to then have multiple constraints. I want to have everybody be healthy, and I want to keep the cost down. Well, in general, the more constraints you have, the harder it's going to be to have both of them. And you're going to have to come up with some way to evaluate trade-offs between the two. I want a cool-looking car that costs very little, gets great gas mileage, and is big. <laughs> right? This is not going to happen. So you have to decide how much are you willing to trade off on these different axes. And you have this now multi-objective programming. And again, this is what's going to happen. All right. Next thing, I'm trying to read things backwards, is banking. Yes, so asset allocation. So you know, for those of you who are considering finance, a lot of stuff we can do here, how you want to allocate portfolios, how you want to manage risk. Uh, next one is scheduling. This is something I am extremely interested in. We'll be talking about this in great detail later in the talk. But uh, you know, for the airlines, how do you determine schedules? What kind of constraints, what kind of issues, what kind of fudge factors do you have? How many of you have ever been on a flight that was delayed? How many of you have ever been on US Airways? I'm not saying anything about US Airways. I just asked these two questions. I was recently at a conference and I actually missed my talk because of massive delays and problems with the US Airways. Um, and I actually deliberately put them in the thank you section in the not thank you subset of the thank you section. But airlines, when they have their schedules, what do they do? 
Any thoughts of how they make their schedules? As you can tell, I like class participation. If you speak up, email me later. They overbook. They overbook. And they hope a lot of people don't show up. I never understand this. But this seems to happen all the time as they overbook and a lot of people just don't show up for flights. But what else, what else do they do? You know, you've got a 20 minute delay, you're going to miss your connection. Yes? They don't fly at full speed. They don't fly at full speed. Why don't they fly at full speed? It's more expensive. So if they can get away with it, if the flight's on time, they'll go a little bit slower. But if they've had delays, they can speed it up, burn a little bit more fuel, and get you there a little bit faster so people don't miss connections. So then the question becomes, how much of a fudge factor do you have? Would you rather be on a short flight or a long flight if it's running late? Long flight. And then this becomes very interesting as to how would the tower control which planes get to go when. And if you have a couple of flights that are delayed, maybe the, long, the flight that's going further away might get the longer delay on the ground because they have more time in the air to make things up. So there's a lot of wonderful things that go on with scheduling like this that we can talk about. Another one is elimination numbers. I know there's at least one sports fan in this class who views the sports the way I do. Okay? This is a tough year as a Red Sox fan, especially after last night. Uh, anybody remember Happier Times 2004? All right. 2004 was a wonderful year. What happened in 2004? Sox won the World Series. How did the Sox make the playoffs? <laughs> Who do you root for? Who do you root for? Okay. I wouldn't go so far to say barely. <laughs> I mean, they won the wild card with a somewhat comfortable margin. But they were the wild card team, and this was back when we only had one wild card. If you look at ESPN or MLB from you know, 2004, they incorrectly calculate the elimination number, or the elimination number is not the quantity you care about. And the Sox had actually clinched a playoff berth one day earlier than the web pages realized. Because the web pages were not taking into account the fact that the teams not only have games, but they might have games against each other. So the Sox, to get the wild card, the only threat for them towards the end of the season was the California Angels, or no, not the California Angels, what is it? The Los, the Los Angeles Angels of Anaheim, they've changed their name, and the Oakland A's. Either team could have caught the Red Sox, but those two teams were playing each other three times, there was a one game difference between the two of them, and one of them had to win the American League West. So no matter what, because Bud Selig in his finite wisdom has declared baseball cannot end in a tie, this would be like a sign of the apocalypse, at least one of those teams has to get two losses. The way the web page is calculated is if California wins, oh, sorry, if the Angels win all of their games, can they get ahead of the Red Sox for the wild card? Yes. If Oakland wins all of their games, can they get ahead of the Red Sox for the wild card? Yes. The Red Sox have not won the wild card yet. And what they missed is that these teams play each other. So if one of them wins all their games, they also win the American League West, and they're not going to take the wild card. And so this was actually off by one day. All right, the last is for those of you who are thinking of math grad school, sphere packing. Any of you take uh, the protecting information class with professors Lepp and Wooders? So if you're interested in stuff like this, you know, cryptography, codes, sphere packing is extremely important in something like this. Uh, if you have a bunch of spheres, uh, originally it was done with cannonballs. What is the optimal way to stack them? Anybody know the answer? Two. There are two. They have the same density. What's the one everybody likes to talk about? Pyramid shape. Pyramid shape. It's the Gross's hexagon. You, you start off by putting them in a hexagonal pattern, and then the next level is the same hexagon, and you put the balls in the dips, and you just keep building up like this. So this was the intuition as to what the optimal answer should be. There are two. They both have the same density. So you could say this is the best you can do. And the way this is done is through a linear programming problem. And Thomas Hills had a wonderful program. And by this, I mean not just a computer program, but a program of research to actually prove this, where he goes from this infinite dimensional problem to, I think, a 150-dimensional space problem, you know, dealing with something like this that can be done in a couple of years on computers. And it was this massive effort. And it has changed to some extent how mathematics is done. The reception his proof got was fascinating. Where one of the math, the top math, one of the top math journals published part of the proof 
and said, we are saying nothing about the part of the proof that was done by computers, where the computers actually did calculations. And again, this is extremely difficult. Do you trust a computer calculation? Could there be an error there? Sure, just as there could be an error in a human proof. And you know, which do you think is more likely, the error escapes in a computer proof or the error escapes in a human proof? You know, Wiles' first proof of Fermat's last theorem, he was going through it line by line by line with Nick Katz at Princeton. And at one point, Katz asked him, I'm not quite sure about this. And was like, oh, okay, I'm not sure about this. I'm not sure about, oh. And you know, there was a mistake, there was a gap, and it took a while to fix it. Very long, very technical proofs are very likely to have gaps. In computer science, very likely to have issues with computer programs. So you try to put in a lot of test cases, you try to put in a lot of checks, but things could go through. Because of the reception his proof got, Thomas Hales has changed his line of research and has now gone into formal proof theory. And he created something called Project Flyspect for a formal proof of Kepler. And this is known as Kepler's conjecture for the optimum way to pack spheres. The problem is a little bit older than Fermat's last theorem and was solved a little bit after Fermat's last theorem to just give you a sense of how long this has been around. So there are really simple questions that can have very difficult answers. But again, we can often get very close and, okay, I can't quite prove that this is the best maybe, but I can prove that this is pretty close to the best and this is easy to use. And there's an advantage to have something that's easy to use. I've taught a lot of cryptography classes here. Uh, anybody know about the code talkers? Okay, who are the code talkers? The Navajos. So in World War II, the U.S. used uh, Native Americans, they used Navajos in the Pacific theater. And they would talk to each other in their native language. And essentially, no one outside of the Navajos knew how to speak Navajo. Now, the Navajos did not have words for things like tank, battleship, you know, B-50. So they had to supplement their language, and it's very interesting as to how they did this. But they needed a code that could be done quickly. There are more secure codes you can do, although this was extremely secure. And depending on how long things need to stay secure, you might be willing to take something that takes a little bit longer to transmit. But if you're in the middle of a battle and you're being hit by friendly fire, you want to very quickly radio to headquarters, please target over here. You, want, you don't want something that's going to take five minutes to encode. You want to be able to say something quickly. So depending on what you're doing, you have different levels of security depending on the need. Okay. So a couple of uh, places where I have experience. I've actually worked a lot with professors of marketing. When I was in grad school, I was dating somebody who I eventually married who was a student in marketing. And when her professors found out that she was dating a mathematician, they're like, ah, can we talk to him? <laughs> and so it was a lot of fun to apply my mathematics in different places. And so I've actually written papers with two different groups of professors at Wharton. And one of them, which we will be doing in this class, is to help the movie industry find optimal ways to schedule when movies are shown in theaters. And what I like about this is you have a bunch of hard constraints and a bunch of soft constraints. So imagine you own a movie theater. What is a hard constraint that must be true when you are coming up with your schedule? You can only sh show one movie at one screen. Yes, you should not be showing multiple movies on the same screen at the same time. That's a hard constraint. And whatever schedule we come up with, we have to solve that problem. What's a soft constraint? What's something the manager might like? To fill as many screens as possible. To fill as many screens as possible at the same time. You know, the big problem we had is the manager wanted a movie to start every 20 minutes. He didn't want anybody to have to wait longer than 20 minutes. And that was just killing us. And then we basically said to him, how much is this worth it to you? If we can increase profit by this much, are you willing to risk a few? Yes. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, you know, he reevaluates how much these things matter. And so for something like that, there are things that are desirable, but you, know, you give me enough money, and I'm willing to upset a small segment of the population. I have done a lot of work with the Internal Revenue Service and other places on data integrity. So for those of you who have done work on Benefits Law with me, this is looking at data sets. Data sets have interesting distributions of leading digits, and you can use this to detect fraud. Another one is I've done a lot of work in sabermetrics. And so in terms of operations research, this is a wonderful example. If people want projects along these lines, especially people who have computer science skills, I supervised a great thesis with Carson last year. He was math CS about how to manage the bullpen and pitchers across a season. 
So if you only have one game, it's not so difficult to figure out how to use your, your pitches. The fact that Major League Baseball doesn't do that is another story. But when you start adding in, you're playing multiple games, multiple series, and you care about different games, maybe different amounts. How do you use your bullpens? How do you gamble based on who you're going to need in the future? Uh, he has a lot of the code already done, a lot of the work already done. If anybody is looking for a great project, I would love people to do something along these lines. All right, so course mechanics. So homework, 15%, midterm, 25 final, 25 class participation, 10%, project, 25%. To just cover myself, these percentages may change a little bit. But a huge part of this class is going to be doing a class presentation, writing a paper, and then listening to other people politely and learning from them. I am saying this now because some people had trouble believing that this was a reasonable expectation the last time I taught this course. So I want to make sure everybody understands. You are all extremely smart, talented, hardworking, or able to fake it. Okay. You will be doing great work and you will have things that you can learn from each other. Okay? A good chunk of this class is going to be listening to presentations. In an ideal world, you'd be working in groups of what size? One, two, three. All right. This is a large class. We really cannot afford to have groups of size one. Okay? It's also good to learn how to work with other people and get things done. If there are any issues with groups, you know, I will talk to you about how we can deal with them. Uh, my wife had an interesting situation a couple of years ago where somebody told her the day before presentation that somebody in the group offered to pay the rest of the group to do their work. Is this a violation of the honor code? I mean, you're so quick to judge. Do you know, I mean, you, those of you who are saying yes, can you recite the honor code and can you tell me exactly what this violates? Oh, I, 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 I'm not saying it's not scummy. I'm saying, is it a violation of the honor code? What if you write, this work was financed in part by a grant from... <laughs> you know, I, I think it matters whether or not you tell the professor that one person is paying the rest of the group to do the work. Now, she's actually teaching a business course, and this is actually how the real world works. But uh, everybody will be contributing. If there are any issues, please let me know. But you do need to learn how to work with groups. You do need to learn how to manage meetings, times, divisions of labors, and get things done. At the end of the day, you are responsible for making sure your group gets everything done when it's supposed to. And I have unfortunately seen in other places where people trusted someone in the group to do something and then at the last minute realized they hadn't done it. So I'm just making sure everybody is warned now. Your neck is on the line in groups. Now again, this should not be a problem. You should all be working well together, but you need to learn to make sure that there are no excuses. You know, uh, France, oh, we're sorry. We didn't want to build the marginal line all the way to the north because, you know, those are our neighbors and we're friendly with them. We just hope the Germans will only attack this way. Okay? You know, excuses often lead to dire consequences. All right. I'm not going to equate this to the fall of France because <laughs> that happens very frequently and this will not happen nearly as frequently in this class. Okay? But what I want you to get into the habit of, I want you to get into the habit of is being responsible, is making sure things get done. Do not trust other people. You know, if your neck is on the line, you are part of it. You need to make sure things get done. Okay, so the prereqs is linear algebra is the only prereq for this course. And of course, by having linear algebra as a prereq, anything that linear algebra assumes is implicitly a prereq as well. Analysis is not a prereq for this course. Computer science is not a prereq for this course. Stats is not a prereq for this course. If you have those, wonderful. There are at least five of you who have said you are taking this as a stats course. If you are taking this as a stats course, your project must have a significant stats component to it, which must be approved by either myself or a statistician in the department. Okay? This is because we now have a stats major, and it now actually matters whether or not you are taking a course with a math designation or a stats designation. Now, of course, if you're taking this as a stats class, presumably, bless you, this is because you want to do statistics. And this should not be an onerous requirement. If you want to switch from this from a math to a stats course or a stats to a math course, by all means, feel free to do so. In some sense, it's actually better to take this as a stats course, not as a math course, because it gives you greater flexibility if you decide to be a stats major later, so long as your final project will have a significant stats component. All right, office hours uh, to be determined. Whenever I am around, it is office hours. Uh, in previous years, I have promised you cannot find a three-hour block between 9 p.m. and 7 a.m. to email me without getting a response. 
It may slip to four hours this year. I'm not sure. I, I am fairly good at responding to email. So if you have questions, email me. We were working on TAs. Again, as I said, if anybody's interested in being a TA, let me know. And then, you know, again, talk to each other. You're going to be wonderful resources. There are going to be some of you in this class who are great at programming, some of you who are great in computer science, some of you who are great in probability. Talk to each other. Use these expertise. I do not use the different online services that Williams provides for courses. I use very primitive web pages that I maintain. The reason is this way, whenever Williams sends out an email saying, we are now upgrading to this new system, or we're now changing to this new system, there will be a faculty orientation meeting. I can just smile and hit delete. <laughs> and I can then listen to my friends complain about, I'm trying to figure out now how to do the following in the new system. It doesn't seem to work anymore. I go, yes, I, I just code in HTML directly. Sorry. That said, if you want to have discussion boards for, for class like this, I'm happy to arrange for something like this, either through Glow or through some other service. If somebody wants to take point in setting up something like that, please email me, let me know. Okay, and also, yes, feedback. Uh, so for those of you who have taken a class with me before, uh, especially if you've done some research with me, these are not the way I like to define the Fibonacci numbers, but I will define them this way because this is the standard way. The email account is evesmath at gmail.com. The password is 0112358813, the first eight standard Fibonacci numbers. This is a way for you to anonymously email me if there are any issues. A couple of years ago, I was at a school where a couple of students came to me. They were former students of mine, and they said, can we talk? And I said, sure, and they closed the door. And I apologize for those of you who've heard the story three or four times already. It's never a good sign when students want to close the door in your office. You know, it's not normally, I just won the lottery, and I wanted to thank you so much for all the help you've given me over the years. <laughs> and so they tell me, we're supposed to be in group theory right now. And I'm not always the most compassionate. So I said, okay, so go to group theory. What are you doing here? I said, well, the professor's teaching the wrong course. I'm sorry? He prepared the wrong course over the summer. He prepared Galois theory. Well, what happened when you taught him this? Well, he said, how much group theory do you really need to know for Galois theory? I'll teach you the group theory you need to know in a week. So they felt comfortable enough to come to me. I hope you will feel comfortable enough to come to me if there are any issues with this class, with the department, with Williams, et cetera. If you do not, however, this is a way for you to anonymously contact me. And then I, you can either tell me, email this account. But of course, if you have another account, I, you can just email me anonymously from that account. Or you can tell me, reply back to this account. It does not have to be about problems in this class. It could be about problems in the department, problems in the college, problems in the country, problems in the world. <laughs> the further you go from Math 389, the less likely I am to be able to help you, but I will try. If you want me to balance the budget, fix the problems in the Mideast, I will try, but no promise of success. Now, that would be, of course, an A-plus uh, project for this course, <laughs> either one of them. Okay? But you know, again, if there are any issues, this is a good way to contact me. Okay, other things, you know, web pages, I said, numerous uh, handouts there. If there are things that you want, things that would be more useful, let me know. I'm happy to work them into the class, both in terms of topics, because we have a lot of flexibility, and in terms of additional reading. There's a lot of springboard things we can do here. Uh, next is, as I said, the opportunity to help write a book. The last one is to prepare for class. At some point, I would like the different groups to have their own team names. Uh, the best team name I ever had of any of my students was Team Jerk. And it was, of course, just an acronym of their names. But you should really be thinking of this as this is your job. You know, unfortunately, you're not going to be well paid. And you're going to be working hard. But you know, this is your job. You come to class prepared. And that means you read the stuff ahead of time, and you are prepared to discuss. I have two little kids at home. Uh, I think this is the time for the obligatory picture of them. So I forgot to actually put this in the thing over here. So here is Cameron, and here is Kayla surrounded. I don't think there's going to be time to say exactly why they're in this boat and how this is related to operations research. So I'll probably have to save that to uh, some point later in the semester. I have plenty of opportunities to play father at home and make sure things are done. You are in a 300 level math course. I am trusting you to get things done and not having me nag you. you know, have you done your homework yet? OK? All right. So here is some advice from my brother. The first is party less than the person next to you. Uh, in the first class today, I had one person sitting in the front row by themselves. And so they're going to have a very boring semester. <laughs> at least everybody else has at least one neighbor. All right. Take advantage of office hours and mentoring. When you enter the real world, it is going to be much harder to find somebody 
who will devote as much time to you as the professors here at Williams. This is one of the strengths of coming to a liberal arts college. His last piece of advice is learn to manage your time. And this is an extremely important skill. Do not put things off to the last minute. And this is why, as I was talking earlier, when you're doing your group work, make sure things are getting done. Make sure that the group is working well. And if it's not, hopefully we'll have time to fix things and do things about it. I, I am happy to do practice interviews. I'm happy to adjust deadlines. They can be for reasons such as I have a very important job interview, or I can hand in a homework assignment. Hand in the homework assignment later, concentrate on the job interview, do research for the company. That's far more important. Or Williams is playing Amherst. You know, so long as you win, absolutely fine to you know, rearrange things. Uh, a couple of years ago when I was at Brown, one of my students wanted to get out of giving a talk and postpone it. So well, wh why do you want to rearrange? I'm on the rugby team, and the women's rugby team is traveling to Africa to play the different national champions. Like, okay. You bring me back a newspaper clipping so that I know you were actually in Africa playing. And you know, she did, and they beat everybody but the champions, so they did extremely well. I'm very happy to work with you on stuff like this. Now, of course, if you do your work ahead of time, these things become less important. Get ahead in the reading. Read far ahead. This way, when life happens, and it will, you have a buffer. And so hopefully by the end of the summer, sorry, I'll switch, by the end of the semester, you will be at the same point we end. So you know, read ahead, get things done when you can. You are supposed to know linear algebra. I may or may not do a quick blitzkrieg review of linear algebra. Uh, depends exactly what's going on. If you're very uncomfortable with linear algebra, either email me directly or anonymously. Here's a link to a linear algebra book. There's numerous linear algebra books you can use. I want you to have basic familiarity with matrices, basic familiarity with solving systems of equations, uh, eigenvalues, you should know those. Uh, ideally, you should know how to use the matrices to solve Fibonacci numbers. I, I will probably review that because that is not as standard of a topic. OK, useful links. If you do not know how to use Mathematica, if you know some other program, that's fine. If you don't know how to use LaTeX, that's more serious, and you need to learn how to use this. So here are some links on how to use LaTeX. This is to do the scientific writing. Uh, in addition to templates for talks, for papers, for posters, it also has video tutorials. So basically, it just walks you through how you get everything to work. And there's one for Mathematica, there's one for LaTeX. So I strongly urge you to read these and to master them. Now again, this is not something that you have to master by Monday, but this is something if you haven't done before, you should start working on this. You want to have familiarity with some computer program. I used to tell all of my students, if you know a probability course, a stats course, and a computer science course, you will always have a job. So for those of you who are smiling, why do I no longer say this? I'm sorry? Nope. Yes. There was somebody who sued her institution because she did not get a job upon graduation. And because of the Freedom of Information Act, you can actually download her lawsuit where she misspells tuition. <laughs> and she claims academic discrimination that her school did more for people with a higher GPA than for those with a lower GPA. And her 2.6 is just as good as someone else's 3.6. I don't know. Because of the way our law system works, I have not been brave enough to actually look and see if she's won. Uh, if somebody wants to, and let me know, but please only let me know if she lost. <laughs> um, so I now will not guarantee you jobs upon your graduation, although I will try to bring people into this class to employ you. It's still very good skill sets to have. Okay, so here are some examples, here are some different jobs and tasks we can do. All right, so the first is a YouTube video. Who are my college football fans? Okay. Who, who, who actually watched this game? All right. Okay, wait, so... All right, so the... the, um, the let me see if I can get the sound to work better. All right, so I will... Oh, actually, I should be able to... Okay, I should be able to click. So this is Alabama versus Auburn. This is one of the greatest examples of optimization and trying to make the right decision. So the game, if you look at it, it's tied 28-28. Alabama has the ball, and they challenged the ruling on the field that time expired at the last play, and they argued that there was one second left. Upon review, the officials determined that there was one second left, and they give Alabama the ball with time to do one play. And Alabama has a choice. Take a knee, do a long bomb to the end zone, or hope for a penalty, or try to kick the field goal. They try to kick the field goal. 
Auburn is on defense. They have a bunch of choices. They could put everybody on the front line, or they could hold somebody back just in case the kick goes short and you catch the ball. And if you catch the ball in the air, you are allowed to try to return it. And Auburn decides why not just have somebody back there just in case the kick goes short. If you cannot figure out what comes next, um, I do not understand your ability to reason in sports, and you will not do well on my exams if you cannot get it from this much of a clue. Did you know Alabama actually put in their backup kicker for this play as well? Yes, because they thought he had a better chance of kicking it further than their regular kicker. And in fact, kicking it further turned out to be a very bad decision. So this is one of the more interesting, uh, oh, so it's not letting me click. Right, so I will click the old fashioned way. All right, so. For anybody who's an Alabama fan, I apologize. I mean, at this point, it's clear. And they're going, no flags, no flags. So. <laughs> One of the most shocking ends in professional sports of all time. And you know, again, you have these teams that are trying to optimize their chance of winning. What should their strategies be? And again, what are the odds the kick is going to be short and you're going to be able to make it? Well, we thought the chance was better to have something like that happen than put an extra person on the line of scrimmage to try to block the kick. All right. Anybody know what this is a picture of? Stacking logs. Good enough. <laughs> so, uh, I've been talking with Wickma about incorporating various things in the classes. And so what this person is holding over here is a log ruler. Not a slide rule, a log ruler. And so here's a slightly better picture of it. It's tough to see over here. It has 16 sides. There's markings on the sides. And somehow these were used to try to figure out how much to pay the different loggers. It's not entirely clear how they were used. And so we have a very nice donor who's given us a really nice collection of Americana stuff, which included two of these log rulers. And so Wickmer would like us to figure out how they work. And so anybody who's interested, let me know. We will go down. We have special permission to handle it, make observations, recordings, and try to figure out. They have done some research, and they've contacted various logging societies. And I wish they hadn't done this, but they have some rough idea of how it works if we get stuck they can give us some help. But the idea is, can we figure out how it works from what's going on, and is it doing a good job? Could we make a better log ruler today? Any science fiction fans? Anybody know the following? Uh, can Kraut six bagels bring home for Emma? Anybody know that? It's from a wo what book? I'm trying to remember right now, but it's... it's Canticle for Leibowitz by Walter Miller considered by many one of the greatest science fiction stories of all time. After World War III, most of society has been destroyed. There's a couple of monks who are trying to preserve what knowledge they can from the 20th century. And essentially, they're just copying things they don't understand what they're copying. This was in the Blessed St. Leibowitz's own handwriting. And if you know Jewish names and if you know Catholic names, you can figure out the humor of the Blessed St. Leibowitz. They don't really understand what this means, but his shopping list is one of the holiest relics in their society. You know, they've lost exactly what it is. Over here, for this log ruler, we can still figure out what it is. There's still enough loggers going around to figure this out. But you know, it's fast approaching the point where no one is going to be around who will remember stuff like this. All right. Uh, this is from one of my son's uh, baseball tournaments this summer. So he is getting a nice hit here going to first. Uh, this is from later in the season. They ended up getting second place to our arch rival Bennington, who basically beat us every single time. It was at least a close game, this one. The way these baseball tournaments are run is horrible, and it makes me cringe as a mathematician. Now, as a father, I understand this is your know, boys, you know, six to eight years old. This is low stakes. It doesn't really matter. But if you can make things more efficient and fair, why not? And so the way they do their scheduling is terrible. What they do is they have a couple of play-in games before they determine seeding for tournaments. And they look at the one loss record. And then after they look at the one loss record, if there's a tie, they look at how many points you score and how many points you allow as the tiebreaker. What's wrong about this method? Are 
there's that. What else? If you play stronger teams, if you, play stronger teams you're, you have a huge disadvantage. So the initial assignment, you only play maybe three of the eight teams. If you happen to play the two best teams, you're at a huge disadvantage. So I have gone in a lot of tournament leagues in Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Vermont, and New York to allow us to come up with a better way to run their tournaments next summer. So we already have this as a job. I can almost tell you exactly what moment this is. This is my daughter over here, Kayla. This is Cameron over here. Kayla's swim lessons are on Tuesdays from 6.15 to 6.45. Cameron's are from 6.30 to 7.15. Kayla swims for less time, and after she's done swimming, her swim instructors are just idle and just sitting at the pool chatting. What should they do? So Kayla goes 6.15 to 6.45, and then her instructors are just idle. Kim goes from 6.30 to 7.15. Yes? Yes! Or I don't have to rush there. I don't have to have one kid waiting. This is not optimally designed. So I've talked to the Y in North Adams about having us do their scheduling. And so again, the subtitle for this class is How to Help Professor Miller's Kids. <laughs> Which, the subtitle of that is How to Help Professor Miller. <laughs> okay? And so this is another scheduling problem we can do. This is from the Young Mathematicians Conference at Ohio State. This is the second year in a row I have done something. Uh, anybody know what I did? I did this last year as well. And I did this without asking for permission. Uh, basically, I, I, the table was initially against the wall over here, so you could only go through it on one side. And this is foolish. You know, you've got this big bottleneck. Why not push it out a little bit? All right. Anybody can identify this? Look at his split. And you have the uh, place with all the nice drinks that's supposed to be cold in the sun. Not really where I would put it. Now, you do have the power outlet over here, and so I can somewhat understand that, but. This is a sad story. This is the netting at uh, the Pittsfield Baseball Stadium. I took my son there. We were sitting right behind home plate, and I tell him, we have the best seats possible. We're right behind home plate. We can see all the action, and we're absolutely safe because of the netting. 10 seconds later, a ball goes through the hole at the top, because they didn't have the net go all the way to the top, and hits somebody in the eye 10 rows behind us. You know, Cam's jaw drops, absolutely shocked as to what's going on. And I'm not trying to explain to him your know, physics about the angle coming in and coming <laughs> down. And that we are safe. I was correct when I said we are safe. I thought other people would be safe as well. <laughs> that was the error. That was the improper assumption. But there's no reason not to have the netting go all the way up to the top. This is a smaller thing. This is the calendar. Do you guys get the calendars each year from Williams? Yeah. I don't like what they did to the calendar this year. And so it's tough to see on this picture. Over here, they have the last month and the next month, whereas now this year they just have the previous month. In October, I really don't care what date the third Saturday in September fell. I care about things in the next month. So I've already talked to the communications office about this. OK. And then the last is we're not going to have time today, I think, for Pascal's triangle. This is, I think, a really good place to stop. So if you have any questions, let me know. And then I will try to get these videos online.